gaming is a living, breathing, and procreating beast. And like most beasts on our planet, death is inevitable. Many times gaming bursts games that are not fit for our cruel and competitive world and natural selection takes hold. Today I would like to pay homage to the many still bursts of gaming. Much like a paleontologist uncovering fossils and trying to figure out how a fossil came to be and ultimately passed on. I would like to dive into the many games that I uncovered from the vault and provide you with some sadness for the emptiness that these games have left behind and some nostalgia for reminding you of them. So imagine you and your friend are teaming up to take on another squad in an epic 5v5 battle. Each game's pretty quick, lasting around 20 minutes, and the goal is simple. Wreck the other team's core to win. Every battlefield's got its own quirks and cool side missions. Nail those and you'll get some sweet boosts to help your team push to victory. You get to control a unique hero, each with their own cool moves and playstyles. As the game rolls on, your hero levels up, snagging awesome talents that beef up your skills or give you a new one, making you a bigger threat and super valuable to your team's game plan. HOTS is based in Blizzard's universe, so everything revolves around something in their IP. Either a Diablo hero like Diablo or an Overwatch map with the same objective from that map in Overwatch. Blizzard is famously late in copying other companies' ideas, but this case is especially ironic. Because MOBA started on a Blizzard game, Warcraft 3, no, 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 no. and on a custom game called Defense of the Ancients or Dota. This custom game was created by Icefrog. Dota was the start of it all, and if Blizzard hadn't fumbled Icefrog and supported him in making Dota 2, then our world today might be very different. But instead, Valve poached him. Welcome to Team Fortress 2. Please let me know what you think. I can be reached at Gaben, 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 Gaben. And with his help, made Dota 2 exclusively on Steam. Many argue that it's not actually dead since the servers are still up and there is still an undisclosed amount of people playing the game. But normally when a development team enlists skeleton crews to run the game, then it's essentially dead. HOTS was released far too late to catch up to the already entrenched League of Legends and the upcoming Dota 2. It still tried its best to especially incorporate esports into the mix, but not many people cared about the game. If you wanted to play a MOBA, League was the main sweetheart and most people would choose that over HOTS. There were a number of unique things that HOTS does that the competition doesn't. Instead of leveling up your abilities, you already have all your abilities from the start, and you can level up certain talents that change the way the abilities work. Elige un talento. Or the talents can change the way your hero works in general. Another unique feature that HOTS has is no shop. The focus was just to get into the game and play, and not worry about what items to build and what to min-max. All heroes have a shared XP pool as well meaning that everyone on your team is the same level as you and the same for the enemy team. The primary focus of HOTS was to have shorter, objective-oriented games instead of the long, drawn-out farming games that typical MOBAs have. Which, if you have been in an hour-long game in other MOBAs where you are just absolutely demolished, then it's a welcome concept. Most people weren't that interested, though. December 13, 2018. On that date, Blizzard announced that they would be shifting some of the development team from HOTS to other projects. They stated that they would continue to support the game with new heroes, themed events, and other content, but the cadence would change. This announcement marked a significant reduction in active development, aligning with what many consider to be maintenance mode. This is the only game in this video that still has actively working servers. I believe that HOTS is still the best MOBA ever created. I don't really find the farming phase of MOBAs fun, Instead, I like the team play and the fast-paced nature of the games. It's heartbreaking that Blizzard, a company that hosted the very first MOBA ever created, didn't take full advantage of what they had and instead stubbornly sat by as another small indie company robbed their IP and the creator of it from right under their noses. Despite its innovations and Blizzard's legacy, HOT struggled to emerge from the shadows of its predecessors. It's a classic tale of innovation meeting the harsh reality of a market already dominated by giants like League of Legends and Dota 2. Dongate was a massive online battle arena game developed by Waystone Games. Their champions were called Shapers, but had the same idea. Choose a Shaper and a role, then play the game. 
The whole idea of choosing a role was new to MOBAs and even to Dota and League back then. You had four roles you would choose from. Gladiator, Tactician, Hunter, and Predator. Gladiators focus on killing lane minions. Tacticians focus on harassing enemy shapers. Hunters focus on killing creatures in the jungle. Predators focus on killing enemy shapers. Whatever role you chose, you would get some passive benefits to help with it. Dungate was only two lanes with a large jungle in the middle. On each corner of the map, there were four spirit wells that gave your team passive income if you captured it. Dominion in League of Legends is a good example of that system, but Dongate had implemented it into its main mode. Dongate did a couple things right. The two lanes, the spirit wells, and shapers were all amazing. Two lanes and a large jungle encouraged more interaction between players as opposed to just constantly jungling all the time. The spirit wells were a nice little addition giving players that liked farming and jungling something extra that they can provide to the team. It's obvious the developers played MOBAs beforehand and had a ton of ideas for shapers and just implemented them into their game. Let me show you some of the cool shapers that we all missed out on because of EA's greediness. The main shapers that made me love Dongate were Renzo and King of Masks. There they are. <laughs> <laughs> Renzo, my nemesis, we meet again. And today I smell of victory. Renzo has no idea who you are. Renzo is a sculptor and a dashing one at that. He gained inspiration whenever he basic attacked an enemy as well as armor. Inspiration is his resource essentially, and autoing or using his Q Inspiring Strike could generate inspiration. Inspiring Strike is Renzo's Q and he slams an enemy with a giant hammer, damaging them and generating inspiration. Then you use his W or E to spend the inspiration when you are fully inspired. When you have full inspiration, you would initiate with E, which is called Kinetic Sculpture. You fire a stone at an enemy, damaging and stunning them. You also reduce their armor if Renzo is fully inspired when casting. Then Q them and just chase them around, eing them off cooldown. Or you could initiate with your alt, which is called Masterpiece. Renzo creates a pool of mud, slowing all enemies inside. After a brief delay, a marvelous statue of Renzo bursts forth, damaging and knocking up all targets hit. I'm trying to think about how I want to set this up. I should just use it. <laughs> just use his ultimate. I, I think just just let them bask in the glory. Of right. It. Renzo's ultimate is called Masterpiece. Thank you. <laughs> so? Oh, I love that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it does all the different poses, too. Oh, I didn't even realize that. <laughs> he is a playmaker support, which are some of my favorite kinds of heroes in all MOBAs. King of Mass is a bit different from Renzo. He is a ranged magic control mage that focuses on CC, slipperiness, and area denial. The control part comes from three of his abilities, and the slipperiness comes from one of them, and his most important one too. Flourish is a short distance dash that empowers King of Mass next Q or E. This is the key part of the ability. If an enemy witnesses the empowered cast, King of Mass may dash again. He also gains an empowered version of all of his abilities. His Q is called Captivate, and it spawns a group of tentacles that travel to the target location and deal magic damage to nearby enemies. And it also roots when flourished. His E is called Endless Delight, which throw a sack of eggs at a target location, dealing magical damage in an area if an enemy steps on them. And it also fears them when flourished. His ultimate was called Finale, which tosses his cage at a target location, dealing magic damage and pulling in all targets to the center. So how do you execute King of Masks combo? How I did it was like this. Flourish in front of an enemy to get closer to them. Hit them with a Q Captivate, which roots them in place. Then ult them, pulling them into the center, and before they are able to move out of your ult, flourish again. And press E, which fears them, and at that point, they are normally dead. He is essentially a CC chainer in the flesh. Think Ari's ult, but you can always use it. He can keep someone CC'd for like 5-6 to six seconds on a good day. And you have no idea how annoying his combo is. I appreciated the creativity of Dawngate. The change into two lanes, the different kinds of shapers, the role declaration. Something that other games didn't do until far into the future. And the rune system. But ultimately, it's up to the market to decide whether something stays or goes. And maybe the Sears at EA, so that this game would just get beaten out by League time and time again, and realize that spending countless amounts of money into an endless pit wouldn't work out in the end. 
lost potential is the right way to look at it. There was a lot of potential, and the team at Waystone Games had some cool ideas. Pulling that away from us for some arbitrary goal that EA had for this game was just devastating. Money rules the world. Listen, the stark reality of it is that many other MOBAs tried and failed to upend the top two, League and Dota. MOBAs were a great time period in gaming. Unfortunately, not everything is given the opportunity to be seen through to the end. Competition is a fierce beast, and by its very nature, not everyone will survive. It is inevitable for there to be a top of the hierarchy with everyone else scrounging up whatever they can at the bottom. Please have your emergency beacon service. In a remote island paradise, 16 contestants have 25 minutes to explore, scavenge items, craft weapons, build traps, hunt, and kill each other. Only one will be crowned the winner. Do you have the guts to survive? The culling focuses heavily on melee combat. You use jabs, charge swings, blocks, and shoves in a system that's simple to learn but requires practice to truly master. There are dozens of melee weapons in the forms of blades, axes, bludgeons, and spears. Weapons are divided into tiers based on damage from the lowly crafted stone knife to the mighty sledgehammer. Different weapon types also apply different wounds, which factor into combat strategy as well. All melee weapons can be thrown, adding the potential for ranged combat in any encounter. The culling was my first battle royale, and jeez, was it a doozy. The crafting gameplay was cool. Being able to pick up a rock and stick and make an axe or combine certain items to make bows was amazing. The main draw for me was the melee combat. There were ranged weapons in the game like bows and guns, but ammo for guns were sparse. And if people had certain buffs with beefy melee weapons, they could charge you while you were aiming your bow and just destroy you. The strange mix of stadium and forest was an interesting setting too. I can't tell you how addicted I was to the culling and how it essentially sprouted my interest in a brand new genre, battle royales. Think back to the first time you tried something that meant a lot to you. The amount of novel experience that you probably had during the first one to two weeks of engaging in that thing most definitely got your brain going haywire with dopamine. There we go. Why is he not giving me it? God damn it. Oh, she's got a good ball. Thank Are you, you a male? That. Are you a female? I hope you feel better. Good health will keep you healthy. Being aware of your health status will help you survive during your time on okay. the island. I better get something good. I bet he gets something good like a medicate or something. If I went up there, I'd find nothing. There he is. So what he got? Really? What now, mate? Nice. Crap! Hey, hey. Knew you'd do that. Give me a... Oh, fuck. Give me a ball. You just beat that contestant to death. <laughs> that is what the calling did for me. From what I remember, it was one of the first battle royales ever made. It even came out before PUBG. I was immediately hooked. The strategic gameplay of having to work with what you have right when you dropped into the map was just so fun. And obviously that is why many play battle royales today. We have to understand back then, 
I had never experienced something like that before. Another thing that added to the addiction was the melee combat. When looking at the gameplay, it looks pretty goofy now, but back then, being able to parry slash block slash jab and all those little moves made the melee combat system really engaging to play. I can't tell you how many times I won the last fight of a match through sheer skill and mastery of melee combat, blocking with my spear and then killing him with a headshot. It's just so satisfying. Honestly, by the time the game ended, I had already moved on to different games. When I saw the news that it was ending, it was terrible. I mean, The Calling was my first love for Battle Royales, and it sparked a big and crazy journey for me, so I always look back at it with love. Moving on from The Calling felt like leaving behind a first love. It wasn't just my introduction into Battle Royales, it was a gateway to a new world of competition and camaraderie. Even as I explored new games, the rush of those early matches on the island, the thrill of survival, lingered in my gaming DNA. You know, I've been gaming for about 20 years now. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of gaming experiences that I have had, and the fact that these three games stand out the most is a testament to how great they were and how much of an impact they had on me. Heroes of the Storm blessed its heart, but it just missed its mark and got buried as a result. Dongate wasn't even given a chance to live up to its potential. It's like, you know, killing a kid before he can even do anything, and the culling was improved upon and also buried. That is the insane thing about progress. You might make some landmark thing and put it out in the world, then you might just get improved out of existence, even though you were the founder of it all. I mean, it really didn't help that they did that thing with culling too, where they basically just copied PUBG. That was not a good look. Anyway, I am grateful for doing this little dive back into some games that I truly loved, and I hope that you enjoyed listening. Whether you are listening with nostalgic ears and rose-tinted goggles, let me clue you in on a little secret. Don't go back and actually spend time looking at these games. Just enjoy this nostalgic feeling and leave it at that. Because if you do go back, you'll realize that those games really weren't all that great. Hence why they died. Though these games have faded from our screens, their legacies linger in the ways they've shaped us in the gaming world at large. Gay Ben, Gay Ben, Gay Ben, Gay Ben at valvesoftware.com Gay Ben Gay Ben Gay Ben Gay Ben at valvesoftware.com Gay Ben Gay Ben Gay Ben Gay Ben